December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The minesweeper Condor is on patrol less than two miles off the entrance to Pearl Harbor. The officer of the deck sees something about 50 yards ahead off the port bow. He asks the sailor what he makes of the object. That's a periscope, sir, the sailor replies. And there aren't supposed to be any subs in the area. The Condor sends a blinker light message to the destroyer Ward. Sighted submerged submarine on westerly course. Speed, nine knots. Already in flight, Commander Mitsubo Fuchida, who will lead the Japanese air attack on Pearl Harbor, sees the Japanese aircraft carriers rocking on a choppy sea. Crewmen cling to the aircraft to keep the planes from going over the side. The carriers turn into the wind, and the first wave of planes, 183 fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes, roars into the sky. Pilots reconfirm their navigation by using a Honolulu radio station's music as a guiding beam. The U.S. destroyer Ward, having found the submarine reported by the Condor, moves in for the kill. The Ward's captain, Lieutenant William W. Outerbridge, has been in command for only two days. He orders his men to open fire. The second shot strikes the submarine at the waterline. The submarine heels over and appears to slow and sink. A message is sent from the Ward to the 14th Naval Headquarters at Pearl Harbor Naval Station. We have dropped depth charges upon sub operating in defensive sea area. Then, almost immediately, a second, more detailed message. We have attacked, fired upon, and dropped depth charges upon submarine operating in defensive sea area. Outer Bridge believes that the message will show superiors that the destroyer had not just seen a submarine, but actually had shot at something. The Army's Opana Mobile Radar Station is one of six radar stations on Oahu. Radar is a new defense tool in Hawaii. One of the two privates on duty looks at the radar oscilloscope and can't believe his eyes. He asks the other private to take a look, and he confirms the sighting. Fifty or more aircraft on a bearing for Oahu. The privates call the Fort Shafter Information Center the hub of the radar network. The ward had sent out its message about attacking the sub in code. At headquarters, code clerks decode the message. The message gradually makes its way to the top, Admiral Husband Kimmel, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. Because there had been so many false reports of submarines recently, Kimmel decides to wait for verification of the report. An Army lieutenant who is training at the Radio Network Operations Center at Fort Shafter gets the Opana radar station report, the biggest sightings the radar operator had ever seen. By now, the planes are about 70 miles away. The lieutenant believes that the radar had picked up a flight of US B-17 bombers heading from California to Hawaii. For security reasons, he cannot tell this to the radar operators. All he says is, well, don't worry about it. US codebreakers have cracked the Japanese diplomatic codes. From a Tokyo to Washington message, President Franklin Roosevelt and General George Marshall, Army Chief of Staff, learn that Japanese negotiators in Washington have been told to break off talks. Believing this may mean war, Marshall sends a warning to Lieutenant General Walter Short, Commander of Army Forces in Hawaii. Marshall's message goes via commercial telegraph. It will reach Short's headquarters at 11.45 a.m. He will not see it until about 3 p.m. Japanese pilots see a long white line of coast, Oahu's Kahuku Point. Fuchida, looking down on Pearl Harbor, sees no aircraft carriers, which the Japanese hoped to destroy and thus thwart U.S. retaliation. The carriers were out of port on missions. He orders his telegraph operator to tap out attack, then other taps. Attack, surprise achieved. At the command center on Ford Island, Commander Logan Ramsey looks out a window to see a low-flying plane. A reckless U.S. pilot, he thinks. Then he sees something black fall out of that plane and realizes it's a bomb. Ramsey runs to a radio room and orders the telegraph operators to send out an uncoded message to every ship and base. 
Air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. The coordinated attack begins as dive bombers strike the Army Air Force's Wheeler Field north of Pearl Harbor and Hickam Field near Ford Island's Battleship Row. The Japanese, wanting control of the air, hope to destroy American warplanes on the ground. Most U.S. airplanes have been parked wingtip to wingtip in neat rows to make it easy to guard them against sabotage. Most are destroyed. As part of a U.S. plan to bolster the Pacific forces, 12 B-17s had been ordered to the Philippines. The first stop is Oahu. Unaware that Japan is attacking Oahu, they prepare to land. Because they are unarmed to save weight, the B-17s can only dodge Japanese fighters and U.S. anti-aircraft gunfire. Most manage to land intact. One touches down on a golf course. An armor-piercing bomb dropped by a high-altitude bomber pierces the forward deck of the USS Arizona battleship, setting off more than 1 million pounds of gunpowder, creating a huge fireball and killing 1,177 men. A sailor on the torpedoed battleship Nevada sees the Arizona jump at least 15 or 20 feet upward in the air and sort of break in two. In nine minutes, the Arizona is on the bottom. Through the flames and smoke, the destroyer helm speeds to the open sea. As the helm leaves the channel, a lookout spots a Japanese sub snagged on a reef. The helm turned hard right toward enemy submarine, shoots, and misses. The two-person sub breaks free and submerges, but it snags again. Trying to escape from the foundering sub, one crewman drowns. The other is washed ashore and becomes the United States' first World War II prisoner of war. As the destroyer Monaghan tries to get out of that damn harbor as fast as possible, a nearby U.S. ship signals that it has sighted a submarine. The Monaghan heads for the sub at top speed, hits it with gunfire, then rams it and drops depth charges. The charges are so close that when they explode, the blasts lift the Monaghan out of the water but do not damage it. The sinking minute submarine fires a torpedo, but it does not hit anything. The USS Nevada battleship gets up steam in 45 minutes and, with anti-aircraft guns blazing, heads for the open sea. A sailor sees its U.S. flag flying in the smoke and thinks of the words of the Star-Spangled Banner. The Nevada was the only battleship able to get underway. Japanese planes of the second wave bomb the ship, hoping that by sinking the ship in the narrow channel it will bottle up the fleet. Recognizing the risk and the danger, the Nevada deliberately grounds itself off Hospital Point. The second wave, 35 fighters, 78 dive bombers, and 54 high-altitude bombers, meets heavy anti-aircraft fire. Bombers attack the Navy Yard dry dock and hit the battleship Pennsylvania. Another bomber hits oil tanks between the destroyers Cassin and Downs. Onboard ammunition explodes, and the Cassin rolls off its blocks and into the Downs. Bombs hit the light cruiser Raleigh, which had just been torpedoed in the first wave. Crewmen jettison gear to keep it from capsizing. A bomb blows off the bow of the destroyer Shaw. Pieces of the ship rain down half a mile away. A photo of the spectacular explosion becomes one of the best-known images of the day. Except for the Arizona, Utah, and Oklahoma, every ship sunk or damaged December 7th will sail again. Japanese fighters rendezvous with bombers off Oahu and follow them back to the carriers. Of the 29 Japanese planes lost, anti-aircraft guns probably shot down 15. Exultant Japanese pilots urge a third strike. If the gasoline tanks at Pearl Harbor are hit, they reason, the Pacific Fleet will be out of action for weeks. But superiors, saying the attack has been successful, rule out a third strike. One reason? The whereabouts of the U.S. carriers is still unknown. From the ships and airfields come the wounded, some horribly burned, others riddled by bullets and shrapnel. At some hospitals, casualties are laid out on lawns. 
Medics convert barracks, dining halls, and schools into temporary hospitals. For many severely wounded and dying men, all nurses can do is give them morphine. They then put a lipstick M on their foreheads to indicate the pain-killing drug. The death toll eventually reaches 2,390. The Japanese strike force turns for home. In the 44 months of war that will follow, the U.S. Navy will sink every one of the Japanese aircraft carriers, battleships, and cruisers in this strike force. And when Japan signs the surrender document on September 2nd, 1945, among the U.S. warships in Tokyo Bay will be a victim of the attack, the USS West Virginia. I actually had the opportunity during my final deployment in the U.S. military to go see the Pearl Harbor and all the memorials there, and it's really a very interesting, somber, and sobering sight to behold, uh, including I was able to make it on one of the boat trips out to the USS Arizona Memorial, and that's really just kind of incredible. The fuel oil that's leaking out of the Arizona is supposed to last another... 57 or 87 years or something like that. I can't remember ex the exact date, but it's some ridiculously long number, the amount of fuel oil that's seeping out of it. Anyway, um, a little bit of a different video for today. I kind of like to mark important sort of holidays, particularly ones of military significance to America. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you tomorrow for regularly scheduled War Thunder content.